typically any theft over a thousand dollars is is a felony level, which you know per state definition is um, a sentence of imprisonment for over one year. Um, if they're indicted federally, that can obviously carry um, typically a lot more um, terms as far as like prison sentence goes. They'll have different charges in federal money laundering statutes, and you know depending on you know, if you're just charged with theft all the way up to RICO or racketeering. But, you know, there's a couple that I'm working right now where that juice is definitely worth a squeeze, uh, where this person has laundered $2 million just in the month of March alone. What's up, Aiden Nation? Welcome to Dapp Central, your home for everything blockchain and crypto. I'm your host here, Fareed. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. I'm going to be joined by Jake Tuzinski, who's a police officer within Minneapolis to talk about Cardano, crypto, and fraud. So make sure to buckle down. And I think this is going to be an interesting chat here, given the sort of hype around crypto and the recent fraud and just sort of theft activity that we've seen here in the ecosystem. Without any further ado, let me go ahead and bring the man up himself. Jake, welcome aboard. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me, Fred. I'm really great. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a different type of interview, um, but I first and foremost want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for your time. We're going to be talking a little bit about real-life theft and real-life fraud when it comes to crypto. Now, of course, that would include Cardano, Ethereum, Bitcoin, etc., but I'm really happy to have you here and to be able to pick your brain a little bit, given the fact that you are an actual officer. So before we go any further, do you mind maybe introducing yourself to the Cardano community and maybe just give us a little bit about your experience as a police officer so far? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I've been a police officer for about 12 years or so. Um, I started in Colorado and I moved back home to Minnesota uh, about five or six years ago or so. And uh, I've been personally into crypto for I don't know, five or six years since about 2017, 2018 time frame, And since that time, I've uh, just kind of been learning about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, how it operates, how transactions work. And now in my line of work, I'm starting to see some crossover with some fraud scams. And really in my city, which is um, a suburb of Minneapolis called Brooklyn Park, um, we've seen a very noticeable uptick in frauds and scams targeting all sorts of different demographics from the elderly to we have a high immigration population um and so there so i've just kind of been trying to drink through a fire hose and learn learn how to investigate it and try to you know prevent scams and also try to make some victims whole thank you um i've actually also noticed an uptick in my inbox of people reaching out to me number one promoting scams now i'm pretty adept and pretty aware of you know what is pretty fishy but I've also had people actually that have been scammed reaching out to me to see what can I actually do. Now, a lot of times with the scams or the people that have been impacted by scams that reach out to me, it's dealing with instances where they were, for example, um, taken advantage of by somebody who's pretending to be help desk or some sort of support for a particular protocol. But I think you might be dealing with a different sort of fraud. So I want to turn it over to you, you know, from a police officer's view, can you maybe highlight and give us um, just like the, the big picture view of the type of scams that you encounter, as well as the type of fraud when it's related to crypto. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think too, you know, being personally in crypto and then professionally as a police officer, um, I've seen kind of both realms of the scam world. Whereas, you know, on the personal side, you know, we're all kind of familiar with rug pulls or scam projects or wallet draining type scams. Um, but in kind of the everyday life, um, I'm seeing a lot more cryptocurrency scams that you would not ever think people would be getting scammed with cryptocurrency. And kind of like I alluded to before with this elderly population, we're seeing a lot of um, phishing attacks uh, where they're either getting fake emails, phishing emails about fake purchases they may have made through Best Buy or PayPal. They call a customer service number and they start getting talked into doing things that otherwise they wouldn't normally do, like going to the bank and withdrawing 10, 20, $30,000 worth of cash and depositing into Bitcoin ATMs. Um, one other thing that these scammers are kind of doing as well is they're actually paying for sponsored customer service phone numbers. Um, I had one elderly person actually Google Xfinity's customer service number, and the very first Google result was a scammer's phone number, and that's the one he just happened to call. Yeah, that's really crazy to think that they've gotten so advanced to where they figured out those type of techniques, understanding that as a user, 
that's going to be the first thing that you do when you get reached out to, right? It's to try to verify the phone number and they're almost like a step ahead. Um, now let's maybe just start from the very beginning. Let's say that, you know, someone has been defrauded. How do you guys typically open or begin a crypto related investigation? Yeah. And I think too, that, that kind of speaks to maybe the broader point of reporting these scams anyways, why I'm so appreciative that you're taking the time to do this interview is because they're so vastly underreported. Um, you know, within the crypto community, there's kind of like a little bit of an acquiescence of, well, your money's just gone. It's never coming back. Too bad. So sad, which I think is just not a good take to have as a society. Uh, I don't think we should just normalize being victimized. Uh, but otherwise, typically how it inputs is they'll make a police report like you, like anybody would call 911. They'll make a report to a patrol officer. They'll come out, they'll gather some basic information um, as far as how much money they lost, what they did, where they went. Um, hopefully they still have the Bitcoin ATM receipts. That's just kind of what we see the most of. That's why I'll probably mention it a few more times. Um, and from there, the report will get forwarded to me um, if it involves cryptocurrency, at least within my agency. Um, and then I'll probably usually got to follow up because, you know, police as well is way far behind in the cryptocurrency world, the scams, how they operate, really like what a Bitcoin address even looks like. Not a lot of people know what to ask for it, to give it. Um, officers aren't getting pictures or any information related to it. So um, that's kind of the, the very starting point is if you do have a scam, you got to provide that kind of basic information so we can actually try and, you know, find the source of the funds. And as a quick follow up, you know, from the police department's viewpoint, is there any sort of training that's offered to help officers better understand crypto? And then also to better understand what types of questions to ask when dealing with crypto related fraud. Um, yeah, there, there is. Um, there's some kind of high level stuff um, that's offered through free companies. Um, one is called the NW3C.org. <clears throat> They're a nationally accredited white collar crime kind of a, a training agency. A lot of it is free, but otherwise there's really not a whole lot. Um, and that's kind of something that I've kind of taken on myself, at least for my region, is to actually develop a training course that now um, is accredited through our state licensing board that I can try to teach other cops within our metro area in the state. Um, kind of, you know, from basic level, what is Bitcoin to um, actually tracing, writing warrants, seizing crypto assets and um, trying to return it to victims and investigate these scammers. And, you know, again, try to try to recover some funds for some of these victims because they're we're getting slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine losing <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of dollars to a scammer only to find out that I potentially won't be able to get that back. But kudos to you for taking the lead, right, for being proactive, at least in your department, to teach right others about how crypto works and how to potentially investigate. Um, as a side tangent here, I would I would love to potentially see right how you would fare with some sort of catalyst proposal. I'm sure you're already aware of Project Catalyst here in the ecosystem, but mm -hmm. to be able to get funding directly from the Cardano network to teach more right about crypto to people um, that are within law enforcement that may not be um, as educated as you are. I think that would be a really interesting initiative. I think that a lot of people could get behind that. And obviously that would offer a lot of value, not just to the police officers, right, but also to the victims when they come in to report those um, thefts or um, fraud instances to different police departments. So um, any thoughts maybe surrounding that? Have you ever thought about, you know, reaching out to official foundations um, to sort of formalize the effort that you started there in your local area? Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, that's that's an incredible idea and the kind of one reason why I'm drawn to the Cardano community anyways, um, both personally and professionally is, you know, there's just not a lot of scams that are purported on it. There's not rug pulls. There's not um, a lot of shady people. Um, you know, I think one thing that really cemented for me in the Cardano community early on was I think when uh, MinSwap was launching and Sunday Swap had already launched, they had actually found like a pretty devastating code bug. Um, and versus like, you know, letting that happen or exploiting it, like you've seen in other ecosystems, they actually alerted with them and worked with them. And I think that just kind of speaks to the overall, um, integrity as a whole that the ecosystem has. And I think that's, you know, kind of purported and been from the top, um, you know, Charles and IOH, IOHK and, um, but as far as getting funding, I mean, that's, that's probably the number one issue for local law enforcement. Um, you know, I really kind of sometimes can conflate just government or law enforcement in general is like this one giant pool.
But, you know, in, in my city where I work, I'm one of probably 50 agencies within 30 square miles, we'll say. Um, if you threw a rock, we'd hit 20 different departments. And, you know, a lot of these departments are 20, 30, 40 cop agencies that just don't have a lot of funding. Um, they don't have tools. They don't have staffing to go to trainings or pay for training. So, I mean, yeah, anytime that we have funding opportunities, I think that would be that make a huge impact on on hopefully preventing scams, because that, that's really a lot of what the focus, I think, should be on is really fraud awareness, prevention, stopping it. And then also to focusing on some of that recovery if and when we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think half of the battle is awareness and as end users or um, customers within the actual crypto and Web3 space become more aware, it's going to become increasingly harder for them to um, fall prey to the people that are per or are, are doing the scamming right so um i think half of the battle is 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 literally making people aware of the different techniques that people use to take advantage of them now let's maybe just jump back here to the agenda we've talked about how you initiate an investigation let's say that you have something ongoing what are some of the challenges right now that you see right being on the front lines when it comes to these investigations yeah, I think some of the, the hardest part is the unfamiliarity with crypto just in general as a whole. Um, again, kind of working with the elderly population, they're they're more susceptible to, um, they keep really good records, which is nice. You know, they write almost everything down, um, but they're just more susceptible to um, trying to facilitate something, trying to do right by somebody. A lot of the times these scammers trick them into thinking like they've made a mistake. And so it can be really hard to convince them that they actually are the victim of a scam, um, that no, this person, you know, this Southeast Asian person is not um, in love with you, that this investment is not real, that you don't have to pay tax to withdraw your, your profits, or your gains. Um, so I, I would say like with the elderly population, they can be very trusting, they can be very open with, um, you know, the information and they, they share a lot, maybe probably a lot too much sometimes with these scammers. Um, so that can be kind of the biggest challenge. I would say the, the other main challenge is, um, just the permissionless and borderless nature of cryptocurrency as a whole. Um, you know, bank wire transfers, if you're transferring fiat one, you know, we can, we know exactly which bank account it's going to typically they're going to have a lot of KYC information about the recipient on the other end. Um, you know, some of those are shady LLCs or, um, people who don't, really exist anyways, but more likely than not, it's there. And to, to that point, you know, you typically have a couple of days uh, before that money is either settled, moved on, cashed out, whatever. It's just a lot easier to, to, to follow it because you have a little bit more time with these transactions. Um, but, you know, the, the variety of the scams within the cryptocurrency atmosphere and kind of what I was just speaking to about the elderly people kind of investing or falling in love with people online, um, and it's not just elderly, but that's kind of what I am seeing is um, th this is going on for several months. So we're talking six, 12 months that a lot of these scams are going in. They're out hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when you're talking about, you know, you can send a cryptocurrency transaction from one spot to another in seconds, you know, 12 months is a lot of time for that money to move around and to jump to different addresses. Um so that's that's probably the number one challenge is just we just don't get these scam reports fast enough and it just moves a thousand times by the time we do. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned a, a lot of times people being too trusting. Um, again, specifically with the credit community, you know, it, it's almost like you want to get people the benefit of the doubt, but that's literally what the 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 fraudsters or the scammers are are preying on. You know, the fact that mm -hmm. you're, you're giving them the benefit of the doubt, the fact that you're entertaining whatever their request is. And as you mentioned, it's not necessarily something that happens once and it's over, but it's something that could potentially last, you know, months. You said six months all the way up to a year. Right. So it's almost like a long con where you get somebody really invested to the point where they feel like, OK, I, I must be doing the right thing. But like, why? Why does this keep on happening? So that's actually going to segue us into the into, into the next piece here. Excuse me which is sort of just dealing with how you're able to track and potentially trace um, and hopefully recover funds. Do you mind breaking down, you know, how that works from an investigator's perspective? And then I also want to follow up by asking, how often do you actually recoup funds? 
Sure. Um, yeah. So I would say that's the beauty of the blockchain, right? Is that it's digital, it's immutable, it's there for everybody to see. Um, so that's why kind of at the at the onset, you know, I said it's very important for investigators or patrol cops to get these these Bitcoin ATM receipts or these cryptocurrency addresses that the victims are sending their funds to, because that's ultimately how we start tracking it. Um, me personally, um, I usually always start with open source methods, um, just digital blockchain explorers, usually blockchain.com or Etherscan. Um, and just kind of see with the wallet activity. I try to confirm my victim's deposits into these suspect addresses. And then from there, it's kind of following where that money goes. Um, so with the different kind of cryptocurrencies, it's surely different on um, how you can follow it. You know, with Bitcoin or Cardano or these other ones using a, a UTXO accounting based method, um, it can be a lot easier sometimes to follow that exact um, you know, what I refer to when I explain to people like that dollar bill um, type of transaction where you have to consume that whole output each time you send it. Um, whereas Ethereum or inevitably when it goes to USDT on Tron, which is 99% of them, um, you know, just trying to have a reasonable and ethical accounting method that you use every single time, um, you know, whether that's like a kind of last in first out or proceeds in first out um kind of thing it's it's because a lot of times it, too, it gets tough um you'll have twenty thousand dollars from your victim's account then you'll have six other transactions come in that are fifty thousand sixty thousand seventy thousand and then one outgoing for a hundred thousand um so it's it's about ethically following your victim's funds to get to um, that investigative end um from there i'm lucky enough to have access to like a commercial software tool that i can show here in a little bit um that it can actually kind of help map it out track it, trace it. Um, it has typically better attribution information about, you know, hey, does this address belong to an exchange? Is this an unhosted wallet? Um, has this address done cross-chain swaps? Does it have attribution to the dark web or to CSAM sites or any other kind of um, potential threat actors? Um, and that can be really helpful. As far as recovering funds, I would say I've had probably the most luck with these Bitcoin ATM scams, just kind of the nature of them. They're typically like a, a one and done. They'll hit the victim one time, um, keep them on the phone for three, four hours, get their 10, 20, 30 grand out of them. And then they'll move it almost exclusively right to an exchange. And if we get the report fast enough, we can serve legal service to the exchange um, and they can hold the funds until we can get other appropriate legal documents like search warrants and, and all that other kind of stuff. Um, so I would say recovery with these types of cases with the the long con ones like we were talking about the investment scams or um what they're kind of known as is like pig butchering with when it turns into like a romance aspect those can be a lot harder because of the time the dollar amount and then you know the victim's kind of unwillingness to even initially report it until they're completely bone dry tapped out yeah i i appreciate all the information that you're, you're sharing with me here jake and the community as well i'm sure that they're learning a lot um, I know for me, it, it always felt like a lost cause. I know we had one particular scammer within the Cardano community that was sending out fake tokens, right? So this was like sort of fraud initiated directly on the blockchain where they weren't calling anybody, right? But they were sending out fake tokens with um, links to bad websites in the metadata of the tokens, asking people to come and claim their airdrops, right? I think at one point, the person had made over a half a million ADA Right. So, I mean, right now at the price of ADA, that's in between a quarter million dollars, which is quite a mm. bit. Um, and people were tracking their address, but it felt almost like nothing could happen. So like in those cases, it sounds like there are tools and there are ways for you to collaborate with other agencies when people actually like try to pull the funds out. Right. So maybe could you talk a little bit more about that, um, how you got how you guys go about collaborating with other departments, but then also. Are, are the funds basically gone if they don't choose to move them off chain or through an exchange to sort of cash it out? Um, sure. Yeah. And that the second part of your question kind of depends on the digital assets itself. So if they're issued through a centralized entity, like some stable coins, maybe um, there's kind of been some development on whether or not we can actually work with that issuer to freeze, burn and reissue tokens. Um, in the case of like USDC or USDT, um, you know, the first aspect of collaborating with law enforcement, it can be tough and challenging and sometimes frustrating for local or even state level agencies. 
um, to work with kind of federal partners um, because they have different thresholds, right? We all have different bandwidths. We all have things we have to prioritize and triage as investigators. And their thresholds are typically, you know, significantly higher than ours. I think federal standards right now are like 2 million bucks. So if I don't have a scan that I can aggregate to 2 million bucks, whether it's, you know, through one victim in, in my city, which is probably unlikely, or after reviewing their KYC return, um, you know, I can't get that $2 million threshold. It's probably not going to get touched by any anybody in the federal level. But one thing that can help is if we start aggregating all these different victims and they file um, complaints through like the IC3.org, uh, which is essentially just a, a I got scammed reporting website that's run by um, the FBI. And they can input their addresses, the amounts they lost, all that kind of stuff. And that's something that we actually cross-reference, or at least I do, um, as far as when I have a scam address, I'll input that into IC3 and see, okay, is anybody else reported being a victim using this address? And that's one thing that can kind of help aggregate us to that level to get these federal partnerships. Um, otherwise, I mean, it's so nice now that, you know, the world is kind of interconnected. I've emailed and contacted detectives from all over the world, you know, other local officers like me in, in Poland and Austria and Germany and all these other places where it's like, hey, how does your investigative method work? Um, your suspects here, this is what they've done. You know, how can we work? Um, there's, you know, even been some instances where we've worked with countries in Africa and now there's kind of some dispute about that um, just based on um, the former IRS agent who's kind of being unlawfully detained there, or at least by U.S. standards, um, by the Nigerian government. So that's kind of at a standstill. Um, but otherwise, I mean, collaboration is is key for sure amongst us local agencies. But the federal partners can be can be trickier um, just with that dollar amount threshold that they have. Yeah, that's definitely got to be lowered. Um, but again, I would understand that because they're federal, they also don't want to get swamped with, you know, cases dealing with 10 grand, 20 grand, they're like, hey, we've got bigger fish to fry. So I mm -hmm. think there's a balance there, but 2 million does seem like a pretty uh, high threshold. Um, let's move a little bit further here because I've got a couple more questions. In terms of tools and techniques, right? You mentioned a potential platform that you guys are working with. If you're able to share that, I'd love to be able to see that, but do you mind maybe sort of breaking down how you guys go about sort of piecing the puzzle back together, but then also the percentage, right, in terms of how often those tools and techniques are successful? Yeah, sure. Um, so kind of how we we have um, pieces together. And I think that's the kind of the great thing about working for a local agency versus a federal or state is that we have a lot more flexibility. Like I can go right to my administration and talk with them about, hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, this is why I believe it's here. This is what we should do. Um, here's like a sample policy we can use to get in place, you know, versus the federal level. I mean, you got to go through section chiefs and, you know, headquarters and all this other kind of red tape and nonsense. And it could take months, you know, years. Um, so I'm fortunate in that way that, you know, at least for the citizens of my city, that we have the flexibility to have these policies already in place. Um, and when I draft these legal search warrants, essentially is what they are. And it's, um, you know, we serve them a lot of times to exchanges that are overseas that otherwise don't have to cooperate, but they do want to be good actors in the space and they don't want fraud and scams reported on their platforms. And they're willing to comply with our judicial orders um, kind of on a voluntary basis. Like I said, they don't have to, they're not within the U S jurisdiction a lot of times, um, but they're willing to do so because they recognize that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And, you know, they don't want to be seen as somebody who are just allowing scams to run rampant and then they get sued by other, you know, various, countries, agencies, you know, ours is the SEC, but, you know, everywhere else too has an SEC equivalent. Um, so as far as percentage recoveries, um, that gets a little bit tricky. I would say we're probably around like 10% of our cases. We're actually able to make like a recovery um, and seize money and make the victims whole again. Now that's also to um, like kind of like a full recovery. There's some, sometimes where we can get like partial recoveries through um, the Bitcoin ATM providers themselves where um, if you're not familiar with Bitcoin ATMs, they typically charge like a pretty high transaction fee, it can be upwards of 30% sometimes. Um, and that's kind of done through, you know, if Bitcoin today is, um, you know, let's just say it's $50,000, 
the Bitcoin ATM will actually charge you at a rate of $65,000. And so you're actually getting 30% less Bitcoin for your $1,000 that you might get. Well, some Bitcoin ATM providers will actually kind of refund that difference. And so that's kind of another way that we can um, recover some of these victims' funds, even if we don't recover the actual stolen funds. Um, but again, I don't, I don't know. I guess I don't blame them for not outwardly advertising that. Um, but it's nice that they do it. And a lot of people, a lot of victims don't know about that. But, you know, luckily through doing this, I've kind of developed some of these relationships and contacts with these ATM providers who, who are willing to help out and pitch in. Thank you. I appreciate that. It sounds like maybe a, a piece of the, the the solution here too, though, would be to remove the Bitcoin ATMs, right? Um, I know obviously that's, I mean, for me personally, I've never used a Bitcoin ATM. I don't know if you have, right? But for me, it's no. like, hey, I jump on, exactly, right? I jump on Binance, I jump on Coinbase, and I just make my purchases there. Um, so I think maybe that's a, a part of the solution because if the ATMs aren't there, there's a little bit of like friction in terms of accessibility um, to where people can just take their hard-earned money and just go dump it in the ATM. Um, but that I think is a, is a conversation for a, another day. Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what happens when you actually catch somebody, right? So we've talked about initiating it, the tools, the techniques, um, some of the challenges, but what happens when you actually catch somebody, you know, how long can they go to jail for? Um, how are they punished? Can you maybe talk a little bit about the jurisdictions and, and all of those things? Yeah, sure. Um, so that can be kind of a, a tricky, nuanced question. Um, you know, for our state level, typically any theft over a thousand dollars is is a felony level, which you know, per state definition, is um, a sentence of imprisonment for over one year. Um, so they're looking at a minimum of year in prison. Typically, it'll, it'll have a different standard, um, sentencing guideline based on the amount of theft, uh, but that also varies from state to state. Um, if they're indicted federally, that can obviously carry um, typically a lot more. Um, terms as far as like prison sentence goes they'll have different charges and federal money laundering statutes and you know depending on you know if you're just charged with theft all the way up to rico or racketeering um you know can carry that um so it kind of varies quite a bit um i would say right now from as a local officer my number one focus is typically recovery first if i can and then it's prevention and awareness um with these suspects a lot of them being overseas there's not really a great avenue for local or even state level jurisdictions to draft or serve arrest warrants to people who live overseas. Um, something I'm trying to really look into, um, there's other legal documents um, where you can work with other heads of states and, and countries to try to get people um, indicted or arrested and extradited. Um, but it's also to kind of one of those things you don't necessarily want to abuse, kind of like we talked about, you know, for a $10,000 scam, are we going to do it? What's the cost of the department to extradite them, to hold them? Um, you know, what happens if you lose the case and they sue civilly? You know, is that juice going to be worth a squeeze is kind of one thing you're really trying to manage with those. Um, but, you know, there's a couple that I'm working right now where that juice is definitely worth a squeeze, uh, where this person has laundered $2 million just in the month of March alone um, through through one of his exchange accounts. So there's there's definitely points and reasons to do it. Um, it's just kind of, you know, the, the right time and the right person, the right place. All right. So you, you have to tell us the story at least as much as you can, if you don't mind about this sure. case that you're investigating with the 2 million, um, maybe just kick us off from the very beginning, um, up until where you are now. Yeah, um, sure. So this is kind of actually like a investment case, um, kind of a, a romance game where they're called pig butchering. If you're not familiar with that's kind of like, you know, fattening the pig up to send them to slaughter. And kind of telltale signs of these are um, this person got messaged kind of out of the blue, a DM on Facebook by typically, you know, somebody who looks like she's a knockout um, and just kind of messaging. They become friendly about a month or so passes and it's, hey, you should invest in this or you should open up um, this shopping website. In this case, um, she talked him into opening what's like the Southeast Asian equivalent of like an Etsy store where he can actually sell products online, make money. Of course, it's all through cryptocurrency. Um, and eventually his shop grew to a value of, you know, just about 2 million bucks or so. Um, and so he's trying to withdraw it to, you know, cash out some of his proceeds. And now it's, well, you've got to pay $80,000 in tax before you can cash any out. And 
Um, that's when he's like, okay, well, like, I don't have any more money. How do I do that? And so then the scammer is like, oh, well, I'll deposit it for you. You just need to put in a little bit more, 10, 20 grand. You know, they just really try to find out exactly how much you have. Um, and so once he's finally tapped out and can't withdraw, they typically just break all contact with him. Um, so this person was actually pretty familiar with crypto and he had personally invested about a half million dollars of his own money through Bitcoin and is actually sending USDT via Ethereum directly to the scammer of, you know, the, the website that he assumed was his Etsy site to fund orders, buy products, to resell them, so on and so forth. Um, so once he kind of sent me all those transactions, when this one went on for about six months or so, I was able to follow all of his different transactions um, and actually have it up if I can uh, present. Okay, so um, this is kind of the graph here that we have, and I'll just kind of zoom in over here. Um, so he's actually made transactions in several different cryptocurrencies. We have some Bitcoin over here. These are all kind of his Bitcoin addresses. Um, I won't go too much into it, but these are all essentially like his UTXOs, right? Like all of his Bitcoin bills that he has, his public addresses. Well, he eventually sends them to the scammer to fund his his Etsy store. Um, gets aggregated. It's about three quarters of a Bitcoin or so, um, just in Bitcoin alone. This is the address that he sends it to. He also sends to this address where we've got 1.1 Bitcoin or so. And eventually the scammer, pretty much almost immediately, if you're following the dates and times on the screen, um, goes to an exchange. So that's kind of my first um, subpoena point. Um, to, to write legal service to this exchange to say, hey, um, this person was scammed. Um, I verified it's a scam. Would you be willing to provide me with the account details with this person who is a customer on your platform? They say, sure thing. Um, I review that KYC return. Um, spoiler alert, it's not a 10 out of 10 knockout. Um, it's actually like a Cambodian mail. Um, so um, from there, there's, he's also got several transactions. Here's the victim's wallet. And you can see all of these transactions he's sending right now on ETH, USDT, and kind of, you know, the running total there. There's a couple hundred thousand dollars um, just sitting right there. Goes to the scammer's address and then eventually right out into an exchange. So this is kind of one of those examples where we can see we have eight or ten um bounces going into the account, but only four going out. So that's what, again, when you talk about the ethics of, of following the transactions, you really got to be diligent in making sure that you're following and doing things appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, again, just more of his victim wallet, more USDT, more of his wallets, more Ethereum, all into this one scammer address. And now we start getting it broken up. Now, what this can be indicative of, especially of these um, pig butchering type schemes, is now it's actually getting broken up to the different people involved in this entire scam ring. Because this isn't one person. This is like a transnational crime organization, like a very sophisticated, um, very savvy um, criminal ring. And you're actually seeing like almost like payments to employees. This might be, you know, your middle management person all the way down to, I can't remember if this one has um, some, but you'll actually see like, thousand dollar transactions that will go to an exchange whereas that's probably the person who is actually doing the scam and who's behind the phone typing the messages or the one who is providing um like the the facebook profile the pictures of herself or something like that um so this is kind of how you follow it and you can see like this one there's i think there's eight or nine different exchanges so it's a lot of information that we have tried to collect analyze comb through um, to really understand the breadth of this full scam, how many people are involved, and to see if there's any any other kind of recovery you can do. Um, so kind of, I think I mentioned it at the outset of kind of this talk, but a lot of these scams too, they'll all go to exchanges and they typically swap it for USDT, but on the Tron blockchain. Um, so from there, now it's, um, I've taken all of these data points and I've had to plot them based on, on the Tron blockchain. And they just continue to move out and follow up and go from there. Um, if I could share this screen as well. Yep, go for it. I'll bring it I'll up. I'll kind of show yep. another, another visual aid. 
So this is um, actually like the, let me put it in presentation mode here. Oh boy. Um, so this is actually like the scammers um, Tron wallet address that he had sent um, all these funds from the exchange account. Um, one of them that I had mentioned. So we can see his total volume is $40 million. You know, in 20 million, out 20 million that this person has scammed over several, several people on really not a whole lot of transactions. Um, so again, that just kind of underscores like the, the wider breadth of these scams, how prevalent they are, um, how underreported they are, and how many people are really getting scammed through them. Wow. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring you up. Perfect. First and foremost, Jake, again, thank you for what you're doing here, serving on the front lines, trying to make people whole. I cannot imagine how many other people this has happened to that they either haven't reported it or they just haven't been able to like figure it out in terms of being able to recoup the funds. Um, the graph that you showed there earlier, mind boggling as to the work that you have to do to figure everything mm -hmm. out. And then, like you said, after figuring all that out on the Bitcoin blockchain, having to sort of like superimpose that and try to start everything else on Tron, um, that seems like a lot of work. And I would love to maybe dive a little bit deeper in, in future sessions to maybe discuss what can be done to simplify the tracking process and then also make it easier for you guys as law enforcement to jump from one particular set of addresses on one network to another to be able to sort of have like that that um that continuous view of how the funds transacted throughout the entire process but i mean that just seems like a lot of work there and i assume that you you put the, the graph together is that correct yeah yep yeah, so that, yeah, I'm actually I'm hand plotting all these all these transactions, and like I said too, I kind of I cross check them against um, public blockchain explorers too, because you know it's while well, this software is very reliable and is held up in in federal court cases, um, you know I just never want to you know I have one point of failure that if I do get a good recovery or I need to prove this to court, you know I want to swear in front of a judge and jury that I know you know beyond a reasonable doubt that these are scam funds that this transaction happened. And they belong to our victim. Man, we, we need more people like you around, Jake. Again, thank you for what you're doing here, keeping the people protected and doing your best, right, with this brand new technology to try to um, stop the thefts. Again, my mind is still boggled by the $20 million amount. Yeah. That is crazy. Jeez. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, it's really not uncommon. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen hundreds of millions. And, you know, one thing that can be indicative of like, hey, you're at an exchange, but maybe it's just not attributed is that amount of money, that volume of money. Um, but, you know, you saw that one had 1700 transactions. That's not an exchange. That's a that's a person. There's a person behind that wallet. Um, and I've seen hundreds of millions of dollars with that same kind of transaction account. And it's it's happening. It's all a lot of it. A lot of these types of scams are purported in in Southeast Asia, that kind of area. Got it. Got it. Well, um, I know it's the weekend. You've got family. So do I. I want to be yeah. very respectful here of your time. I do want to give you an opportunity to maybe just kind of send us off here with some closing thoughts, right? So maybe highlighting some red flags, some tips, uh, maybe sort of best practices here for the Cardano and blockchain community. Yeah, I would love that. I think um, kind of the main reason I even wanted to, when I reached out to you to, to do this is, you know, we like you said, we all have families. We all have grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles who are aging, um, who may be susceptible to these types of scams. And while we're super familiar with crypto and we might not fall for a Bitcoin or a phishing ad type scam, um, some of our elderly family members might. Um, so if there's one thing that you can talk to your family members about, um, first of all, double check your email addresses. Um, again, Fareed, if I could um, share my screen. Uh, I have a couple of their um, just quick visual aids. Uh, this one here. Um, so here's one example of an email from PayPal that somebody got, and you can see just a lot of red flags about it um, from the misspelling of cryptocurrency. The There's typically some kind of like um, time urgency, you know, within six hours or 12 hours, you have to call this number. Um, these are kind of red flags to look out for, you know, even without looking at the actual domain email address, because most people don't, unfortunately. But if you're just seeing this, you know, if you're 75 years old, you might think it's legitimate. We might not, but, you know, talk to your family about these types of things. 
Um, I can certainly send this to you too, so you can send it out as an example. Um, the biggest thing I think with the elderly and the Bitcoin ATM scams is they're keeping them on the phone for hours and hours and hours to include going to the bank and actually withdrawing the cash. Why the banks don't tell the elderly person to hang up the phone, I actually need to talk to you before you withdraw this $20,000. That's not for me to say. Uh, but if you can tell your family, hey, if you ever go to the bank and you need to withdraw a money for whatever it may be, just don't be on the phone. Um, I think that, that would probably stop a lot of these elderly scams kind of in their tracks um, if we can just get them get them off the phone. The other method with those, those types of scams is they're actually having them download remote login apps. One is one popular one I've seen a bunch is called AnyDesk. Um, make sure, you know, if, if you don't have a reason to be downloading a remote login app, don't tell your family members, please don't. Um, it's just going to grant the scammers access to your phone. And that's a lot of times how they're getting um, the actual like Bitcoin ATM receipts, the driver's license to verify on the online back end to verify their KYC information through the Bitcoin ATM provider so then they can suck that Bitcoin out of that, that account. Um, and that's kind of how that's a lot of times purported. Um, otherwise, um, with websites, with that investment scams, um, double check your addresses. Um, one, if you're investing in cryptocurrency and the exchange is not in the top 100 on CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko, probably a scam. Um, you know, do your due diligence. Sure, there's new upcoming technologies and exchanges all the time. Just make sure you're doing your due diligence. Um, one thing I see time and time again, too, is in the, the address bar, the hyperlinks, there's repeated characters. So the investment um, Etsy, so to speak, one that we just talked about with the graph, um, that website was actually like GLSDDFF um, dot so-and-so. There's almost no website that's going to repeat characters that's legitimate. Um, they just they do this because they'll make this domain, they'll leave it up for however long they're scamming you. And then once you are out of money, they take it down and it's gone. Um, and then they just copy paste the source code into a new website with two different characters. And now it's a whole new website for the next scam victim. Um, so I would say those are kind of like the, the biggest things. Um, report it still to police. Yes, law enforcement is still way behind. Even a lot of local agencies are way behind. Report it, get something on file. Um, I'm happy to talk to any police officer from wherever, anytime about an investigation. If they need help, my contact information, um, I'm happy to share it. Um, I have a, a Twitter account where I typically contact um, exchanges and other people. Um, it's at CryptoCop274. Um, so feel free to reach out to me there. Um, I'll never reach out to you. Um, so if you DM me, um, I'm happy to share it or otherwise free. Do you have my contact details? If somebody reaches out to you, like I said, I'm happy to help. Um, I just want to try to, you know, get people up to speed and um, hopefully stop these scams. Yeah, again, I cannot thank you enough here, Jake, for today's session. Um, I've learned so much, right? I mean, literally, you you walked us from the beginning to the end, and you mentioned some really, really good points. Again, I would love to work with you to sort of raise awareness surrounding frauds and scams. Obviously, I deal with Cardano specifically here, um, but I really think that with Project Catalyst, especially funding round number 12, at the very early stages, like you could put out a proposal to sort of raise awareness within the Cardano community specifically. And you never know, that could blow up and be valuable elsewhere. But um, I want to thank you, right, um, for your time. I want to thank you for your efforts and for all that you've done, not just for the people that you're helping, but also within your department. So this is definitely not going to be the last time that you'll be joining me here, at least if it was up to me, right? So I look forward to definitely <laughs> having you back on to chat a little bit more. Um, but I do thank you so much here, Jake. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be making sure to leave um, links to Jake's uh, Twitter down below. If you guys want to get in touch with them and you're not able to get in touch with them through that, make sure to go ahead and reach out to me. My info is always down below there as well. And if you guys have any questions, any concerns, or just any thoughts that you want to maybe pose to Jake, please go ahead and do that with the comment section down below. But that will do it here for today's interview. Um, 45 minutes of pure knowledge here. 
and again keep in mind guys that jake is an actual officer so like this is his his livelihood um so again i can't thank you enough i really really enjoyed this and for the viewers if you found this to be helpful i would appreciate you if you could smash that thumbs up if it's your first time stopping by consider subscribing for more and as i mentioned earlier if you have any questions then leave them down below that said and as always we'll see you guys in the next video